pleased to welcome as our keynote speaker, Mr. Joseph Stiglitz. He doesn't really need any introduction, but I would say that he is professor at uh, Columbia University in New York, uh, professor of economics, and the founder and co-president of the Initiative for Policy Dialogue. And I invite him to deliver a keynote statement. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure to be here to talk on a, a subject which I think is uh, of enormous importance uh, for the world. Uh, there's been a long history of commodity-dependent and commodity-rich countries not performing well. Uh, this observation is called the natural resource curse. Uh, you would have thought that countries with a lot of resources uh, uh, would do better, would grow more, and because the resources were, uh, especially natural resources, uh, belong to all the people, those countries would have greater equality. The reality is just the opposite. Countries with, on average, most cases, with some exceptions, I'll come to that, uh, have not managed their resources well, they've grown more slowly, and these countries are marked by more inequality. Uh, there are many reasons some related to uh, the failures of markets, uh, some related to uh, uh, po political economy. Uh, one aspect of natural resources is that uh, they are marked by high volatility of prices. And uh, that gives rise to uh, high levels of exchange rate volatility, and it's hard to manage risk. Uh, it's hard to manage risk for any country, but it's especially hard to manage risk for poor countries. And that risk is both macroeconomics, at the level of the country, and microeconomics, individual firms, households. Uh, another key problem is that uh, countries with large amounts of natural resources wind up having an high exchange rate because of the value of the resources that they are exporting. Uh, it, in reality, that re represents a problem because it makes it difficult for the countries to compete, to export uh, goods, to compete with imports, and so it uh, stymies their development. And then there are some uh, further problems in the way the global economy operates. Lenders uh, tend to be very open to lending to countries when prices are high. And there is a strong proclivity for them lending too much. You might say uh, the way the financial market always puts it is there's a proclivity of countries to borrow too much, and they put the onus on the borrower. But the lender is the one who's supposed to have the expert in risk management, knowing the level of debt the countries could sustain. And so countries that are natural resource rich, given the volatility, wind up borrowing too much and then having a debt crisis. And one of the problems that we have in our global architecture is that we have no good way for resolving these problems of over-indebtedness, something the world is going to have to live up to or deal with as more and more countries are facing the problem of excess indebtedness uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic. Within countries, we have bankruptcy laws to deal with debt restructuring. Across countries, we don't. I might add parenthetically, and to give a flavor of where uh, I'm going, uh, there are well-known principles of how that could, can and should be done. The United Nations in 2015 adopted a set of principles for debt restructuring. Almost unanimously, there were only six countries that voted against it. They happened to be six creditor countries like the United States, 
And the result is, as we face a debt crisis, we do not have a debt framework. And the result of the absence of a debt framework is that the restructuring is going to be too little, too late, and too costly for the countries. And uh, that is part of the context in which the natural resource curse has arisen. Uh, there's uh, the phenomenon of what is called the sudden stop of credit uh, plummeting countries into recession. There's a further problem, which is that uh, there is an un imbalance in market power. Uh, typically, uh, there are only a few countries uh, involved in any commodity. And uh, they are able, those companies are able to exercise market power. In your textbooks, you read, uh, talk about a competitive economy. You've all been taught about how markets work and the principles of competition underlying efficient markets. Well, that's a good story, but it doesn't describe the 21st century economy, where, which is rife with market power. And the consequence of this market power is that developing countries and emerging markets typically do not get compensated adequately for their natural resources. So even though they're rich in resources, the amount of money they get for that, those resources is a fraction of what they should be getting. And then, I'll, something I'll come back to in a, in a few minutes, typically, the companies use their market power to make sure that they don't have to pay for the environmental damage that they cause when they extract the natural resources. So the countries receive less money, but bear disproportionately the cost of extraction. And finally, the natural uh, countries that are rich in natural resources natural resource dependent, have problems of what we call political economy. In too many cases, it is too easy to engage in rent-seeking behavior. So rather than what uh, countries that are poor natural resources have to do, they have to work to get what income they have, they rest on the wealth that they have inherited underneath their ground uh, or in agriculture. And the result of that is that there is competition among various groups to get those rents. And that competition for the rent, that rent-seeking behavior, diverts resources from creative activity, from productive activity, and uh, uh, that's uh, another reason um, why it doesn't work. There's rank seeking both from those within countries, but also rank seeking from those without, including from the financial sector w that I mentioned before that takes advantage of the moments when they're rich to lend them money beyond what they ought to. Well, much has been written on how to combat the natural resource curse and to turn commodities, resources, from a curse into a blessing. And towards the end of my talk, uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, give some of the uh, elements of that. But I want to take up uh, another aspect that has already been mentioned uh, by uh, two speakers before me, the importance of which has been heightened by the climate transition. For more than two centuries, the advanced countries have exploited the natural resources and commodities of the developing world, exploited in three senses. They have often not paid a fair market value for these resources, as I mentioned before. Uh, as I, uh, firms with market power have driven down the price, the financial sector has taken advantage of the market and institutional imperfections to, chain, to charge high interest rates, and when countries can't repay, extract a pound of flesh, 
made easier by the, the flawed institutional arrangements that I referred to earlier. And secondly, they have not compensated countries for the environmental costs they have imposed. And indeed, the rules of the game, as they have typically been written, have made it difficult for developing countries to get their due. Export tariffs, which might compensate countries for the environmental damage, are discouraged. If a country imposes a new environmental regulation, it will be slapped with an ISDS suit. Uh, these are the suits within the investment uh, 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 framework. Um, and may wind up paying hundreds of millions of dollars in a kangaroo arbitration court in their very attempt to actually protect uh, their environment. It may seem strange, but the poor developing countries have effectively been subsidizing the rich countries. And finally, and importantly for this uh, meeting, uh, the advanced countries have relegated developing countries to the lower rungs in the value creation chain, and that uh, has had the consequences that have already uh, been mentioned. In the era of colonialism, it was power, often military power, that was used to uh, get these uh, outcomes that I, uh, adverse outcomes that I described. In the era of neocolonialism, after the end of formal colonialism, it was again power. Now, more typically economic power that was still used. Today, countries rich in resources continue to be at the bottom of the value chain. But development is about economic transformation, something precluded by being at the bottom of the value chain. The model of development that works so well in East Asia, manufacturing export-led growth, is not going to be working, or at least working as well as it did uh, 50 years ago. Uh, the reason uh, should be obvious. Manufacturing is a increasingly small share of global output and employment, and uh, labor is an increasingly small sh input in manufacturing, and so manufacturing just cannot generate the jobs necessary for the increase in population that we're expected over the next, say, half century. This reality that what was successful, so successful, in East Asia is not really going to be the engine of growth, of the engine of development for Africa and for the countries that have not yet succeeded, has not, I think, fully set, uh, 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 set in in our thinking about development. Uh, there is really a need for another model. For those developing countries lucky enough to have an endowment of highly valued natural resources, there is an alternative, and that is the subject of this meeting. Uh, the alternative is leveraging commodities for sustainable development. And what that means, of course, is not just resource extraction, uh, which leaves a country poor. Uh, it leaves the country poor because it has fewer assets. I mean, if you lit, wrote down a balance sheet of a country, you ought to put uh, uh, not only your financial assets, your human capital, but also your natural resources below the ground and the potential that you have for uh, uh, your trees and your forests and all, all of your natural resources. When you cut them down, you are poor unless you reinvest those either in people or in uh, uh, human capital or physical capital. You, unless you do enough investment, extracting natural resources makes countries poor. And so investment is at the core of uh, managing uh, natural resources in a way that will lead to development. Uh, but it's not sufficient, and I'll come back to uh, what else is needed. Of course, even less than just extracting so resources, it does not mean resource extraction with environmental degradation, making the country doubly worse off. And we know so many instances 
where the extraction of natural resources has been done in ways which have contributed to environmental degradation. There are some natural resources that uh, exist in both developed and developing countries, but the extraction is mostly in the developing countries. And the what reason? Very simple. The developed countries demand high environmental standards, which raise the cost. That's part of the cost of production. And those incentives, uh, 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 those regulations they impose mean that there will be less, the, the environmental destruction can be managed. But the production moves to emerging markets in developing countries because those countries are willing to or forced to, well, I don't know what the right language is, to accept the environmental damage. They do it because they're poor and they say, you know, when you have nothing to eat, you, you say, well, we'll let the environment damage be for the future. But that's a mistake, I think, because they are in, uh, uh, impoverishing the future for the benefit of the current. But the advanced countries are taking advantage of that kind of impoverization in the developing countries and saying, go ahead and ruin your environment because you, we know that you need to live and we'll, you'll, you'll do it. And that's why many of the resources are actually uh, exploitation is in the developing countries. Um, well, uh, as I said, the key issue that of, of this uh, discussion is about uh, how instead of this exploitive model that has characterized natural resources and for uh, uh, forever, you might say, uh, how do we manage leveraging uh, those to move up the value chain? At this point, I need to pause to ask, why hasn't it already happened? Why, after the end of colonialism, and we have, during colonialism, we know why it didn't happen. People didn't have any choice. But after the end of colonialism, with, ex exer uh, with the ex exercise of military force uh, precluded, uh, did the same extractive model continue now for 70 years? And there are multiple factors, and a full analysis would obviously take me beyond this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, the first, I think, uh, and probably most important, is uh, the neoliberal trade regime enforced by the WTO had a system of what is called escalating tariffs. And these uh, set of tariffs, uh, not a same tariff on anything, uh, lower tariffs on raw materials and higher tariffs on uh, uh, more uh, refined products, value-added products. Uh, it was, uh, why, did you, why did they have this structure? It, it was designed to keep developing countries producing raw materials. If you looked at the incentive structure embedded in that system of structure of tariffs, it was to preserve developing country, make sure that developing countries continue just to produce uh, raw materials. Andrew Charlton and I have described this in greater detail in our book, Fair Trade for All. And then we have the intellectual property regime. It too was designed to restrict uh, uh, development, to restrict access to knowledge and technology and with knowledge being central in explaining the gap between developed and developing countries and central to structural transformation, which in turn is central to development, this helped keeping, keep the developing countries down. And then structural transformation required resources. And by definition, the developed, developing countries were poor. But so many aspects of the neoliberal global architecture were designed to keep them poor. Uh, let me just give uh, uh, a couple of examples. The multilateral tax system uh, is one ingredient. 
Uh, we told countries to open their doors to foreign investors, foreign direct investment. But then we designed a tax system which made it very difficult for them to tax to get the appropriate uh, return to the economic activity that was occurring within their countries. Uh, you know, our global multinationals have produced a lot of good products, but they've been even more clever in avoiding taxes. And uh, we have those tax havens that, where uh, money gets moved. Uh, and uh, the result of uh, this is clearly uh, it has deprived both developing and developed countries of revenues. Finally, the developed countries realized it and they got together in an initiative to make the corporations pay their fair share of taxes. But where did that initiative occur? In the club of the advanced countries, the OECD. And what was the outcome? The outcome of this initiative called the Base Erosion Profit Shifting, is a well-intentioned, was that the developing countries and emerging markets got a pittance. What was, began as an initiative to, to create a fair global tax system has failed. I know some of, you, uh, some of your countries are debating about whether to sign on to Pillar 1. Uh, there was one part of it that was good, which is uh, Pillar 2, which was uh, a minimum tax. But rather than setting it at a reasonable rate, it was put at 15%. And then they put enormous exceptions. So the rate, effective rate is more like 12 or 13%. Average tax rate in Latin America is twice that. So setting a minimum way, a minimum tax that's half of what other countries are charging isn't really going to help very much. Uh, and uh, even the United States has suggested it ought to be higher. Uh, the uh, Independent Commission uh, for Reform in the International uh, Tax uh, System that I chair, co-chair, uh, has argued that it ought to be at 25 uh, percent without all those exemptions. But it makes a difference, this is important, because this will give them more resources that would enable them to develop. And this is true both for economies relying on manufacturing, but also economies relying on natural resources. A second example is the refusal of the advanced countries to compensate the developing countries for their ecological services, just a fancy word for talking about uh, the developing countries uh, with uh, forests uh, engaged in an enormous amount of carbon sequestration, uh, which obviously important for climate change, and they very important for protecting biodiversity, and biodiversity has been very important for genetic material relevant uh, for health. 30 years ago, the world agreed on a biodiversity convention. But one rich country refuses to sign, to ratify, sign, it didn't ra refuse to ratify. You say, why? The principles are so clear. The reason is, as it comes out in so many cases, the pharmaceutical industry is afraid that they might have to pay compensation for the genetic material in, that they derive from developing countries. They're all, always talking about the importance of intellectual property rights protecting their patents, but they're not willing to pay for the intellectual property rights related to genetic material and refuse, the result of that, there's a refusal to sign the Biodiversity uh, Convention. Um, the um, inadequate uh, treatment of uh, traditional knowledge uh, within the standard IPR frameworks also deprives countries of, uh, developing countries of revenues that they would need for development. I could go on and, and go uh, into many other aspects of this, but I, I, I want, in my limited time, let me just summarize it. An unbalanced trade, financial, IPR, and investment regime 
much defended on the basis of neoliberal ideology, but more accurately reflecting the legacy of economic power and implemented by a set of multilateral institutions, again, officially reflecting neoliberal ideology, but more accurately reflecting the legacy of economic power, has deprived developing countries and emerging markets both of resources and opportunities to develop. The rules of the game were stacked against them. So now we are entering a new era, and uh, delineated by five marked changes that make me more optimistic that we can rethink the issue, the strategies of development, and that those countries with natural resources might be better able to leverage those resources than they have over the last two centuries. The first is the end of the ideology of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has failed even in the advanced countries. Uh, it has led to uh, slower growth than in the era pre, uh, prior to neoliberalism. It has led to more inequality, volatility that we saw in the 2008 crisis. And it has led to a, a, an economy not resilient uh, that we saw in the pandemic. Um, it's very interesting. I, I, I encourage you to look at uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor speech that he gave last spring in Brookings, where he clearly articulated that uh, the era of neoliberalism is dead. But of course, the intellectual underpinnings of neoliberalism had been taken away four decades ago. I, uh, is what my own research uh, contributed to, showing that uh, markets in general do not lead to efficient outcomes uh, because of information asymmetries and all kinds of imperfections that have been uh, studied. Um, and uh, I, I also, as I mentioned before, when you start looking at how neoliberalism was put into practice, it didn't even conform to the principles that were enunciated, and those principles didn't conform to uh, what economic theory uh, uh, said uh, was good economics. The second, uh, really important, is that climate change is an existential threat, and only through cooperation of all countries can it be solved. And that includes the developing countries and emerging markets who are now the largest emitters. You know, there are a lot of issues, and I won't have, uh, of developed countries say we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. That's great. But that by itself won't be able to solve the problem of climate change. The developing countries and emerging markets have to do it with the same ambition. But that requires resources. And the current configuration of the global economy doesn't give them that resources. And when I say resources, I, I, I want to keep emphasizing it's not only financial resources, which people talk about, but also knowledge, technology. Uh, it's the intellectual property regime. In the Rio Convention, there was a provision, for instance, for uh, compulsory licenses for knowledge related to um, climate, but no one has talked about that for 30 years because the advanced countries don't, don't want that for obvious uh, reasons. But it's self-defeating. If we're, we're in this uh, boat together and if we don't solve the problem of climate change, uh, the consequences will be uh, dire. Uh, the, end, the third thing is the end of the era of hyperglobalization. 2008 showed that excess financial integration led to global uh, instability. The pandemic showed that borders did matter. Countries violated the rules when they felt their citizens' welfare was at risk. Uh, they hoarded uh, uh, pandemic-related uh, health products. The WTO rules resulted in people suffering and dying unnecessarily as a few countries put corporate profits over lives and refusing uh, the uh, vaccine waiver. The Russian invasion of Ukraine and the pandemic has exposed how globalization has left so many countries and their citizens vulnerable. 
Uh, and it showed the lack of resilience, another flaw uh, in uh, the neoliberal regime. With even the U.S. destroying the level playing field with its IRA Act, uh, with subsidies uh, now estimated at over one trillion dollars, um, there is clearly an unlevel playing field. And uh, it constitutes walking away from the WTO rules-based system, admittedly in a good cause, that is saving the planet, but the, no, uh, the nature of the global regime has been brought into better focus. The rich and powerful break the rules when the rules prove inconvenient, even if it is rules that they have been instrumental in writing. Uh, one powerful country has even refused to allow the appointment of appellate judges to adjudicate disputes. It would rather leave it in the, oh, its own hands whether to call the actions of others compliant or not with the international rules-based order. Rules are for the less powerful, and indeed a rules-based order has always been crucial for these to protect them against each other, and they have thought, perhaps mistakenly, against the more powerful. The fourth aspect uh, that is going to change, I think, uh, the opportunities for leveraging uh, natural resources is the new geopolitics, which even as climate change has made cooperation necess a necessity, has introduced new levels of competition. And finally, uh, AI robotization uh, has resulted in a decrease in the value of the uh, assets of developing countries uh, and made it even more uh, difficult. So let me conclude very quickly. Um, in this new world, what can be done to end neocolonial trade and production patterns and to accelerate development in a sustainable way, in a way which enhances living standards sustainably within countries and deals with climate change uh, and takes advantage of new technology. And my answer is based on uh, a few fundamental principles. Development has to be predicated on structural change at the core, is creating a learning society. Markets on their own don't manage such structural changes. Uh, there will have to be interventions of uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, industrial policy, trade policy. Um, the um, institutions and rules that were created after World War II are not well suited and are and as currently constituted uh, to enabling countries, and that will have to change. Uh, uh, the developed countries may be able to leapfrog. They can transform their economy to a sustainable economy based on renewable energy faster, the faster the better, benefiting from the learning that will be derived from that. And this is a moment that those countries that are rich in resources, especially can leverage their market power, and so can, develop, so can developing countries and emerging markets working together. Their collective economic power is significant, even if that of individual countries may not be. And just in, in conclusion, there have been a few countries that, in both the advanced countries and developing countries that have leveraged their natu uh, natural resources and uh, that have, uh, are in the process of doing so. In the advanced country, the country that have managed the natural res avoided the natural resource curse, uh, everybody talks about is Norway. But what they haven't emphasized uh, as much as they should should, is that or Norway uh, has also leveraged it for innovation. There's an important institution called Innovation Norway that try, is industrial policies that try to leverage their knowledge and their resources to get broader growth for their country and a more sustainable growth that will enable them to grow after the end of fossil fuels, which has been the source of their growth. Mm -hmm. um, Indonesia has recently has imposed a, a, a restriction on the export of nickel, greatly criticized by other countries, but greatly successful in sustaining a, a move up the value chain, and much more effective than export tariffs would have been. The restraint, well managed, has been more successful. And Brazil is, is, is 
now in the stage of thinking about how it can use the Amazon as a sustainable source of income rather than devastation that was done under the previous regime. So let me congratulate you on, on uh, taking up this issue. There are many more things. I, I unfortunately I talked more slowly than I thought. And usually I talk too fast. Um, and so I didn't get through uh, saying everything uh, I wanted to. But uh, uh, the important thing, begin by making sure you manage resources so you don't get the natural resource curse, but then go beyond that to leverage, to leverage this uh, to uh, promote economic transformation, and that economic transformation will be the basis of sustained development. Thank you. Uh.